would now like to segue into our morning session on minimal invasive cabbage. Uh, God knows it's, it's tremendously important, especially now, as you know, that there are no real randomized control trials on the horizon for the next five to seven years comparing PCI to cabbage. So cabbage uh, remains demonstrated as a very robust operation, but it is so darn invasive and we have to do something about that. And there are many ways to approach this. There's hybrid surgery, there's robotic surgery, there's minimal invasive cabbage, etc. cetera. Uh, Dr. Joe McGinn is, will be our first speaker. Joe is uh, with no doubt the father of mixed cabbage. Uh, Joe, I, I met for the first time in the spring of 2005. I was 34, 35 at the time, and a young surgeon starting my practice. He had done a few mixed cabbage cases in New York, probably less than half a dozen, uh, which had gone well without uh, leading to the demise of anyone, which is already a huge feat in terms of doing three bypasses through a small thoracotomy at the time. I, quickly, I went to visit Joe, and we started an academic a partnership and a friendship over the years that's now lasted uh, 12 years and, and I learned a lot from him and I think you know we provided some uh, aspects to this procedure we I certainly feel that we grew it together but he was the father of it and, and I was the uh, I don't know maybe the cousin or, 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 or I don't want to say the son but uh, <laughs> so <laughs> in any cases uh, I learned a lot from Joe I learned uh, mixed cabbage at the inception but I also learned his love of boating, which had cost me a dear amount of money since, uh, and, and Joe is an avid sailor. And, and the other thing that I learned, uh, in fact, this weekend is how to be uh, cool with your uh, fantastic grown-up son as well. And, and Joe, uh, Joe's uh, son is here, uh, Joseph McGinn III, one of our attendees, uh, general surgery and research, uh, very dedicated to doing Western blots, et cetera. And uh, it's a fantastic thing to see the, the family uh, leadership tradition continue. So, uh, Joe, we look very much forward to your talk, and thanks for your leadership in making cabbage less invasive. Well, that, was, that was some introduction, uh, and I appreciate that, Mark. Uh, the years have been phenomenal working with you and with uh, your staff and getting so many publications out there and proving the fact that we can do something less invasive than we actually do it right now. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is talk a little bit about my philosophy, but also on a, spend a few minutes on a video that we just created. And I'd like to um, focus on the video and the emphasis is gonna be on a little bit more on hybrid. Now I know Dr. Ruel is not a big fan of hybrid, but what I'm trying to do right now is get everybody energized about minimally invasive heart surgery because the reality is that if we're not into this, it's going to be taken away just like every other field in medicine. So I think we need to figure out how we're going to get to the end point of doing minimally invasive cardiac surgery. So the story goes way back, and I'm going back here in 2006, and I certainly would never... Um, even pretend to be anywhere near as knowledgeable as David Taggart is on the, on the conversation about whether cabbage or PCI is the better approach for complex coronary disease. But there's article after article, and he'll di he gives a great dissertation on how everyone agrees that coronary bypass surgery rules over complex coronary disease, hands down. So along comes the syntax trial. And my, com my comment is, why was the syntax trial even done? We already knew the answer to the question the syntax trial was asking. I'm not going to go through these slides. I'm going to just buzz through them quickly. I think we all know the results of the syntax trial. But after five years, there's a statistically significant difference between coronary bypass and PCI. I think we all agree to that. So the conclusion is, and this is actually a caption from the five-year a sum up of the uh, syntax trial. The bottom line is that all, all groups, whether it's intermediate or severe or even mild, all groups of syntax score patients do better with coronary surgery than they do with PCI. So it failed to meet the uh, non-inferiority goal. ACC guidelines are exactly the same as they were before the syntax trial. And here's the point, and I think Dr. Well and I had talked about this a little bit, is that the endpoints that we wanted as a society were not met. The endpoints meaning that we don't have an improvement over cracking someone's chest open. 
So this is an actual quote from the article in 2013. Because of its old cumber design, Syntax is undoubtedly the most definitive and compelling of all trials of cabbage versus PCI. The investigators estimate that currently about two thirds of patients with complex coronary disease are best treated with cabbage. This was an editorial by David Taggart back in 2013. The reality is that still today, most patients are being treated with stents. This is an article from Frederick Moore. This is the sum up of the five years in 2013, also in Lancet. Despite the joint assessment of patients by the heart team, more than four times as many cabbage patients withdrew consent to participate in the study compared to PCI patients. Later on, the article says probably because patients are concerned about the greater invasiveness of cabbage. So point being that when a patient says, gets randomized to having a cabbage, they say, wait a minute, <laughs> that's great. I wanted to be in the study, but I didn't realize I was getting my chest cracked open, so I'm not going to be in the study. So that was kind of an interesting thing. And of course, reality is that society is willing to accept the suboptimal result to avoid getting major surgery. So we all know the results with surgery is better than with PCI, but yet many patients still opt for PCI. Reason is, we don't have something in between. We don't have something in between the groin stick and the, the major chest surgery that we do. Endpoints. This is something I love to drive home. We as physicians typically look at endpoints as MACE. Did, did the patient die? Did the patient have a heart attack? Did the patient go back to the lab? These are what we consider endpoints, but do we actually consider what patients consider as the most important endpoints? And that's why I think we need to look a little bit deeper into what we do as physicians because we need to do what the patients want us to do, and that is we want to have less pain, quicker return to a normal lifestyle. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over much of this big versus small stuff, uh, but it suffice to say that there's multiple articles, both in the <clears throat> uh, human and animal models, <clears throat> that demonstrate that making a smaller incision is beneficial from a lot of different perspectives. One of the things I'll talk about is the NLR, uh, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. <clears throat> what we did is we took our patients who underwent mixed cabbage and we compared them to a group of sternotomy patients and then we broke them up into three tertiles, the low NLR and the mid NLR and the high NLR. Those the, in the highest NLR, the patients actually ended up doing much better over a five-year period of time. The reason we think is that patients who have a high NLR are patients who are burdened with a lot of inflammation, a lot of inflammatory processes going. There's a lot of patients like this, believe it or not, patients who come in who's got hemoglobin A1Cs over 10, patients who have chronic non-healing ulcers, patients who have chronic bronchitis. These are patients who have a high inflammatory burden. You add a sternotomy onto these patients, now you're increasing the inflammatory burden, and of course, this ends up with a long-term outcome that's not as, well, as good. Again, I'm gonna skip over a couple of slides here because I'd love to get to the video, but I do want to reference this article. This is a landmark article in surgery demonstrating that the internal mammary artery is what confers longevity to patients. And when Floyd Loop uh, wrote this article in 86, a lot of the world was in doubt about whether or not the mammary artery was the graft of choice. But I don't think there's any question about that at this time. But I will tell you that vein bypass is not as good as maybe many of us think it is. There are articles that go anywhere from 5% to 30% failure rate in vein grafts. Uh, as opposed to stents, the failure rate for stents is actually much, much lower if you look at all the meta-analysis out there. So my answer to the question right now is I have a very individualized approach to each patient. For instance, I take care of an 80-year-old patient a lot different than I do take care of a 50-year-old patient. If I have a 50-year-old patient, I'm very likely to put multiple arterial bypasses on that patient, whereas an 80-year-old patient, I'm looking to do what I need to do to get that patient out of the hospital and safe. I also have an individual approach to each artery. I look at, I think the LAD, for instance, always needs to have a mammary artery on it. The other arteries, it's up for grab, it depends. For instance, there's about a five or 10% failure rate with a vein graft to the right, whereas if it's a simple lesion, 
a stent to that same artery could be less than a 1% failure rate. So we have to look at each artery individually. So I'm doing more and more hybrids, um, although I feel very comfortable bypassing any artery through a mixed approach, I feel it's, in, it's more advantageous to the patient to look at all options in this case. So basically we have a best of, both, best of both worlds solution. We have the innovation side of the stent, the groin stick, and then we have the durability of the internal mammary artery. And if we could do it through a small hole, it makes all the difference in the world. So why is this not routine? And a lot of people ask me this, and this is something that I constantly have to come up with a, a new answer for. Why isn't everybody doing minimally invasive coronary surgery? And the reality is because it's not easy. The, the reality is it's a very tough operation with a big learning curve, and it takes a lot of dedication to actually get through that learning curve. Um, <clears throat> The first time this was dis discussed in the literature was actually by a gentleman, Kolosov, in Russia. In 1967, in JTCVS, he published an article where he did a couple of cases where he bypassed the LAD using an internal memory artery, and he, he did it through a thoracotomy. So that was actually the first mix operation back in 67. Since then, there have been tons of articles about non-sternotomy operations, almost 1,800 of them. And I didn't update this slide recently, but there's about 20 or 25 mixed cabbage articles. So there's a lot of different ways of doing this, and you'll hear robotic techniques, direct, uh, direct uh, vision techniques like the one I'm talking about, and uh, thoracoscopic techniques as well. Through the history of minimally invasive heart surgery, we've seen a lot of different iterations between robotic assisted or TCAB or the mini thoracotomy techniques. And we, we started off with the minimally invasive mini thoracotomy, and it was called MVST. I don't know if any of you guys remember the actual lingo, MVST. Um, but now it's emerged as mixed cabbage. This is the basic layout of the surgery. There are three incisions. I like to call the main incision the window. And the reason I call it the window incision is because what we're doing in the surgery is we're bringing the target to the window where we're going to do operation like we normally do. It's different than most laparoscopic or endoscopic surgeries. I think the gallbladder is probably the best example. The gallbladder sits in one spot. We take these long instruments and we go through these incisions and we go to the target. In this situation, we're actually bringing the target to us. We're bringing the target into the window incision and that's where we create our anastomoses. This is a, wait a second. Okay, so this video is, was actually just done a couple of, uh, uh, like a week ago. And it's an operation doing a single bypass to the LAD. And the reason I'm pushing this is because I really believe that if we don't get involved in doing minimally invasive coronary surgery, we're all gonna be out of the business. So I just want, I'll try and narrate this as best I can, but the reality is this is an operation that took me about an hour and a half. Uh, and I put a mammary onto the LAD through a mixed cabbage incision. And uh, I think it's something that almost every surgeon should be able to do and can do. This particular operation involved two incisions, one for uh, the uh, place for the stabilizer to go through and then the window incision. And I will uh, have this video at the afternoon session so that we can go over some of the details of it. but. Um, the incision is made in the fourth interspace or the fifth interspace. I make a little bit of a, uh, a test incision in the fourth space, find out where the apex of the heart is, because you want to be as low as you possibly can be on the heart to make sure that you can get access to the most distal part of the LED if need be. I put a sponge on the end of this uh, long clamp, and I use that to push the heart away. As you'll see who, in the next presentation, there are some certain I'm sorry, well, uh, this is the thoracic retractor, which elevates the second, third, and fourth ribs. And that uh, enables us to get to the internal mammary artery all the way up to the top. But you'll see in some other videos that uh, Dr. Sutter will show that insufflation enables them to get to both mammaries. Um, but we don't have the luxury of insufflation, so I use that sponge stick you can see in the bottom of the screen to push the heart away and give me access to the internal mammary artery.
once you get the setup with the with the rule track and the thorough track retractor, you can see that harvesting zone memory is very much routine as you might do under a sternotomy situation. Clip on the mammary side and buzz on the patient side. It's a little strange to look at the mammary from the opposite side. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but I would think that about 10 or 15 cases is about the is about the uh, learning curve. Clipping the distal end of the internal mammary artery and cutting. So there's your skeletonized internal mammary artery ready for connecting to the LAD. Believe it or not, the hard part of this operation is harvesting the internal mammary artery. Doing the bypass, as you'll see, is very much routine, very, very simple, and it's very much what all of us do on a regular basis. I don't know if you can see how redundant that pericardium is. Uh, the reason it's redundant is because I've started putting all my patients on milrinone at the beginning of the cases, and it shrinks down the size of the heart, enabling me to move the heart around much more readily. And may, it's made a big difference. And there are a lot of tips and tricks on how to do mental use of heart surgery, but that's one of them for sure. So here I'm identifying the LAD, putting a stitch in the pericardium just to hold that up. Now through the, there's a portal in the sixth interspace. I'm putting the stabilizer through that portal. And then I'm gonna connect up the octopus head and place it on the LAD. Now I've moved to shunting all my bypasses on the LAD. I've just gotten to a point in my life where I don't need anxiety anymore. So I uh, open up the LAD and put a shunt in. I can relax and do the bypass under uh, no real uh, stress. And again, the concept here is that you're bringing the target into the window incision. So you can see I'm using a regular set of pickups, a regular 15 blade. All the instruments that you would typically use for a, a mammary bypass are exactly the same. I don't use any endoscopic instruments when it comes to doing the distal anastomosis at all. The one thing you do have to get used to is that your assistant is less valuable to you in this operation, so you have to figure out ways of doing it by yourself. So I use a lot of techniques to suspend the, the uh, conduits uh, so that my assistant can uh, concentrate on doing the Mr. Blower. Again, you can see I'm using a regular scissors, regular pickups. Shunt going in now. I put that little uh, inset up there, in, insert uh, window up there, just to let you know that I try and keep the blood pressure about 140 to 150 when I'm doing the LAD, so they have plenty of time to get the shunt in, a lot of collateral flow, uh, and it makes a big difference. So again, a lot of tips and tricks on how to get this done very safely. Once you get the shunt in, it's just a matter of sewing it, and if you, um, if you have experience sewing on a beating heart, this is pretty much routine. About 10% of the time, I use a pump assist, meaning I cannulate the groin and uh, go on the pump. In those patients who have bad ventricles or have difficult anatomy, and uh, we can apply this technology to almost any patient using a pump assist. Uh, and many times, the pump assist is literally 20 minutes, so it has almost no impact on patient's outcomes. Again, every stitch is visualized using a regular needle holder, a regular Castro needle holder, regular pickups, nothing fancy, nothing complicated. And this particular patient was a patient who's been watched by his cardiologist for a couple of years with chronic angina. Angina to a point where the guy really couldn't even work, uh, but they would not send him to surgery uh, through a sternotomy. They just kept upping his medication and uh, 
I saw him before I came to Houston, and the guy's doing phenomenal. He's very grateful, has literally no chest pain anymore. Now, pain is a big issue. A lot of people, the naysayers in particular, are complaining that it's a thoracotomy, it's got to be painful, but the reality is I don't really spread the ribs very far, and I cut the muscles so I can allow the ribs to spread apart on their own. There's no broken ribs in my cases. Uh, uh, well, I should say very rare. I also put a Marcane infusion pump, and you can see this one going subplurally in the fourth interspace, and that, that pump infuses a quarter percent Marcane and stays in for about five days and relieves most of the pain. Almost all the patients are pretty much numb, uh, so it's a, an amazing technology. Very little pain. Um, let me go on to uh, talk about patient selection. I think this is an important slide. I break it up into two categories, the those who need it and those who want it. The those who want it category, those patients are breadwinners of the family, patients who have some sort of a aversion to getting their, their chest cracked open, and I have a lot of those patients. I get patients from all over the world to come to me because they were told they need their chest cracked open, they're looking for an alternative approach. But I think more importantly, there are those, those who need a category. I've not done a sternotomy on a patient who's on steroids in about five or six years. If someone's on chronic steroids, I figure out a solution that doesn't involve a sternotomy because I do not need to see a sternal wound breakdown. Elderly, deconditioned, de debilitated patients, I'll give you a simple story to illuminate that. Uh, I had a patient about 82 years old, came into the hospital with a broken hip. She sat on a medical service for two, three days with nondescript chest pain. They worked her up for all kinds of different diseases, not thinking it could be possibly coronary disease, uh, but she stayed at bed rest for about three or four days, waiting for the final conclusion that, oh my God, this lady's got coronary disease. So she's at bed rest with all the physiologic derangements that take place during bed rest. She's not being fed properly, and now they do a catheterization, find out she's got a left main with a, a tight right. And they turn her over to us and say, here you go, now you gotta fix that before we fix her hip. It's not a great idea to do a sternotomy on an 82 year old lady in any circumstance. It's certainly worse when you have someone who's malnourished, debilitated, at bed rest for three or four days. So this is a perfect solution to have a patient operated on through a mini, mini thoracotomy, a minimally invasive approach, and these kind of patients do extremely well with this. There are contraindications and I say relative to all of them, because at this point I'm doing about 98 to 99% of my cases through a mixed approach. Um, it's actually, since I've been in Charlotte about eight months, nine months, I've done one sternotomy case. So it's a rare occasion I'll do a sternotomy. I'll always figure out some sort of a minimally invasive solution for all my um, uh, coronary occlusive disease patients. Obesity is a problem. Again, remember, I'm doing this through the window incision, I use my regular instruments. Because the target is so close to the skin, I could use my regular instruments, but when you have three or four inches of fat, it becomes a challenge. So morbid obesity is probably a relative contraindication. Peripheral vascular disease is a relative contraindication. Why? Because my bailout strategy is to cannulate the groin. If I get in trouble, heart fibrillates, I don't get good uh, hemodynamics during a distal, I simply go on the pump. If I do have a patient with diffuse distal disease, meaning I have to do five, six, seven bypasses, I'm doing a sternotomy. It's just not a good situation to do a mixed cabbage on those patients. I don't know if the rest of the world does this whole connect to purpose thing, but we're big on this in, uh, in North Carolina. And I love to talk about Miss Elaine because she's a phenomenal example of why we do what we do. This is a lady who came into the hospital, had a cardiac arrest at home, they defibrillated her, brought her to the emergency room. She fibrillated two more times. They did a code ice, we call it code ice. Some people call it a cold cool, whatever it is. They froze her brain for a couple hours. And amazingly, she came back, but wasn't completely there. She had no renal function, shock liver, and she had severe brain dysfunction. After a few days of watching her, they decided to take her to the cath lab. When they took her to the cath lab, she had extremely severe coronary disease, left main, tight right. 
And they turned to us and said, what do you think? You want to do an operation on this lady who's a train wreck? And we're like, not really. And she's actually a fairly young lady, 61, 62. So we waited a few more days and we did a mixed cabbage on her. Now, if you remember, I talked about the two categories, those who need it and those who want it. This is a lady who needed that kind of approach. The last thing I need to do is put a sternotomy on a lady this sick. But as it turns out, she's also a lady who wants it. Because when she went home and she regained her full mental functions, her liver came back to normal, her renal function resumed, she went back to her home after a stint at rehab. And I discovered that she's not only a minister, not only runs her own farm, but she's also a foster parent. And she was so excited to be able to get back to her kids and back to what she normally does. And this lady is so grateful for the fact that we were able to do a minimum invasive cabbage on her. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on this uh, other than to say that the strategy for this surgery is exactly the same as sternotomy. The way the vessels course is exactly the same. This is a reconstruction of a CT angio on a patient that had a quadruple mixed cabbage. And you can see the veins and the, and the internal mammary artery. They course exactly the same way they, they would through a sternotomy. And uh, I'm going to buzz through this a little bit more. And just, I'm going to just quote this article that uh, Mark Wells, the lead author on, in, uh, published in JTCVS in 2013. We knew we had a good operation, Dr. Well and myself, but we weren't sure that the patency rates were up to snuff. So we decided we're going to check it out. So we did 100 patients consecutively in Ottawa and in New York, and we looked at the graft patency using CT angiogram. And basically, to sum it up, the median length of stay was four days. All patients were followed at six months, no mortalities, no major adverse uh, events. And at six months, we did CT angiogram, and 90% of the grafts were patent. But more importantly, and what I think is really uh, the landmark of this particular article, is that 100% of the internal mammary arteries were patent. So I think it's a great uh, testimony to the fact that this operation really works, it's safe, and it's effective. And if we could get this diffused a little bit more to the rest of our colleagues, I think we'd have a great opportunity to change the way the world looks at coronary bypass surgery. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you this afternoon. The lab will be an important part of this. We're going to go over a lot of the details of how to do this operation.